GB TV News. So watch, and watch, and learn. Thanks, John, and I'm Randy Hansen in today's World News Headlines. A poll says Obama and Romney tied among likely voters. And Romney hits back at Obama over Big Bird comments. And Ohio asked the Supreme Court to curb early weekend voting. And Supreme Court rejects bid to hold telecom companies accountable for domestic spying. And U.S. government sues Wells Fargo for reckless mortgage loans. And Turkey threatens greater force if Syria fire continues. And Greek holds mass protest against visiting Merkel. And out of Brazil, protest by indigenous groups halts dam construction. And Supreme Court declines to block Chevron's $18 billion fine for Ecuador pollution. And Sandusky sentenced to at least 30 years in Penn State sex abuse scandal. And billionaire CEO warns workers of job cuts if Obama re-elected. And a video shows New York police call teenager a mutt during stop and frisk. GV TV News is broadcast on Grass Valley Television, or Division of Rural Counties Television Network, whose focus is on community involvement. We also air on NCTV. But before these stories, GV TV News would like to thank one of our underwriters who supports your only visual video news media in Nevada County. That's right, it's us, GV TV News. In today's first world news story, polls continue to show a narrowing presidential race after a wide lead by President Obama over the past month. A Reuters Epsos daily tracking poll says Obama and Republican challenger Mitt Romney are tied among the likely voters at 45% each, echoing the findings of the Pew survey on Monday. Campaigning in the battleground state of Ohio, President Obama again took aim at Romney's vow to cut funding for PBS and said, just last week when we were on stage together, Governor Romney decided that instead of changing his plan, he just pretended it didn't exist. What $5 trillion tax cut? I don't know anything about a $5 trillion tax cut. Pay no attention to the tax cut under the carpet behind the curtain. When he asked how he'll cut the deficit, he says he can make the math work by eliminating local public funding for PBS. Now, by the way, that is not new. This is what he's been saying every time he's asked a question. Well, we can cut out PBS. So all you moms and kids out there, don't worry. Somebody's finally getting tough on Big Bird. Also campaigning in Ohio, Mitt Romney criticized President Obama for focusing on what he called saving Big Bird. Mitt Romney said these are tough times and real serious issues, so don't have to scratch your head when the president spends last week talking about saving Big Bird. I actually think we need to have a president who talks about saving the American people and saving good jobs and saving our future. Ohio is asking the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn federal appeals court ruling that struck down the state's effort to prevent early voting the weekend before the election. Ohio's Republican-controlled legislature had barred early weekend voting, claiming state officials need time to prepare for election day, but last month the U.S. District Court ruled the state had failed to provide a convincing argument and must extend early weekend voting to all, not just members of the military. Democrats have accused Republicans of seeking to block early voting in a bid to disenfranchise those likely to cast their ballots for President Obama, asking the Supreme Court to intervene. Ohio State Secretary of State John Husted called the ruling orderly early voting an unprecedented intrusion. The Supreme Court has rejected a challenge to 2008 law granting immunity to telecom companies that aided the George W. Bush administration warrantless domestic sp spy program. Groups include the Electronic Frontier Foundation and American Civil Liberties Union that have brought case in consolidating 33 different lawsuits against the companies after a lower court ruled that the firms are protected by congressionally mandated retroactive immunity. 
an appeals court upheld the case dismissal last year and on tuesday supreme court declined to hear it without comment the ruling could mark the end of legal attempts to hold the telecon firms accountable for their spying in a statement, the Electronic Frontier Foundation said, after 11 years and multiple congressional reports, public admissions, and media coverage, the only place that this program hasn't been seriously considered is in the courts. The Justice Department has filed a lawsuit accusing the bank giant Wells Fargo of making reckless mortgage loans that ultimately cost the federal government hundreds of millions of dollars in insurance claims. Wells Fargo is alleged to have abused the Federal Housing Administration program by recklessly handing out loans and forcing the government to foot the bill when borrowers could not pay. In a statement, U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara in New York said, yet another ba major bank has engaged in long-standing reckless trifecta of def Deficient training, deficient underwriting, deficient disclosure, all while relying on the convenient backstop of government insurance. Lawsuit comes two months after Wells Fargo agreed to pay settlement for at least $175 million for discriminating against African Americans and Latino borrowers. The head of Turkey's military is vowing to respond with more attacks if mortar fire from Syria continues to hit Turkish territory, speaking earlier th the other day, Turkey's chief of staff said Turkey's forces could use greater force in the event the shelling from Syria hits the Turkey side of the border. Turkey has launched strikes inside Syria and deployed additional troops in its border after shelling last week when Syria killed five Turkish civilians. At a summit in Belgium, NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen said his military allegiance is prepared to act against Syria to defend Turkey, but declined to specify any details. He also said, we have taken steps necessarily to make sure that there will all plans be in place to protect and defend Turkey, but I think you'll understand very well that why we can't go into details when it comes to such plans. But obviously, Turkey can rely on alliance solidarity, but let me stress once again, the focus of international community should not be, should be to find a political solution to conflict in Syria. It's absolutely outrageous what we are witnessing there. Tens of thousands of anti-austerity protesters gathered in Athens, Greece, Tuesday during a visit of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Police fired tear gas and stun grenades as protesters tried to reach Merkel, whom they hold partly responsible for the deep cuts in Greece for, is being forced to adopt in exchange for an international bailout. Tuesday's protest was one of the largest in months, with dozens of protesters reportedly detained. In Brazil, indigenous groups have occupied the construction of a major hydroelectric dam in Amazon rainforest, bringing work on the project to a halt. $11 billion Belo Monte Dam project was initially approved over the objections of the indigenous communities who have brought numerous challenges, citing environmental concerns and fear of mass displacement. Construction has resumed over the past month after being put on hold to address these complaints, the group Amazon Watch says dozens of indigenous activists have joined in a 24-day occupation accusing the construction consortium behind the project of flouting agreements. The Supreme Court has upheld a lower court ruling denying the oil giant Chevron bid to block an $18 billion fine for polluting Ecuador's rainforest since the 70s. Amazonian residents won the judgment last year after a long-running case seeking damages for Chevron's dumping of billions of gallons of toxic oil waste. The initial ruling called on Chevron to pay $8.6 billion but then rose to more than double that amount after Chevron failed to apologize. Chevron was appealing a lower court decision that threw out an injunction the company had won to to block enforcement of the fine, but on Tuesday, the Supreme Court dismissed the appeal without comment. And former Penn State assistant football coach Jerry Sandusky has been sentenced to 30 to 60 years in prison for sexually abusing 10 young boys. Sandusky was found guilty in June on 45 of 48 counts during a trial that saw many of his victims come forward to testify. Sandusky case sparked a major scandal at Penn State after it was revealed longtime head coach Joe Paterno and top school officials failed to alert police after hearing of the abuse. At his sentencing hearing on Tuesday, Sandusky maintained his innocence in the case outside the courtroom. Pennsylvania prosecutor Joe McGettigan said Sandusky deserves to spend the rest of his life behind bars. He said the victim's statements were a vivid reminder of the defendant's brutal crimes, though no reminder was needed. And frankly, the defendant's behavior and statements today were consistent with the behavior throughout the period of time covered by the trial. That is, he displayed deviance, narcissism, a lack of feeling for the pain he caused others, and to end an unwillingness to accept responsibility. A billionaire corporate executive has sent a notice to employees warning their job cuts could 
Should President Obama be reelected? In a memo sent to 7,000 workers, Westgate Resort CEOs David Siegel writes, if any new taxes are levied on me or my company as our current president plans, I will have no choice but to reduce the size of this company. This means fewer jobs, less benefits, and certainly less opportunity for everyone. So when you make your decision to vote, ask yourself which candidate understands the economics of business and ownership and who doesn't. Whose policies will endanger your job? Answer those questions and you should know who might be the one capable of protecting and saving your job. Before the letter, Siegel was perhaps best known for building the largest private home in the United States. The Nation magazine has released what is said to be one of the few known audio recordings of New York City police questioning a young man of color under the department's controversial stop and frisk program. Audio was recorded last June by a Harlem teenager named Alvin who says he stopped frequently by police. On a recording, police officers can be heard telling the teenager he looked suspicious because he had his hood up and was looking back at them. They also threatened Alvin with physical violence and used racial language, calling him a mutt. New York City police, by their own account, conduct more than 1,800 stop and frisks every day. More than 20% of those stopped reportedly involve force. People of color are disproportionately targeted. About 87% of people stopped last year were black or Latino. And that's it for World News Today. Now another thanks to one of our underwriters who supports your only visual video news media in Nevada County. That's right, it's us, GV TV News. Soundcheck Music Center, the rock and roll connection. We have guitars, amps, drum equipment, sound accessories, lessons, and repairs. We are located at 671 Maltman Drive, Grass Valley, 530-272-7236, open seven days a week. No one needs anyone, they don't even just pretend. I'm afraid of America. I'm afraid of the world. I'm afraid I can't help it. I'm afraid I can't. I'm afraid of Americans. I'm afraid of the world. I'm afraid I can't. That's right, it's time for the police blotter and pictures in the blotter, not from these actual events, but used for visual aid only. These public records are obtained from daily logs issued from Nevada County Law Enforcement, Grass Valley Police Department, on Sunday. At 8.32 a.m., a report was taken from 300 block of Vistamont Drive of three vehicles that had been vandalized. 10.21 a.m., a woman from 200 block of Jorsky Drive reported... Her neighbor was watering plants at random times and water was running down on her deck. She was advised an officer would not tell the neighbor to put plates under the plants. 12.27 p.m. a report was taken 600 block of Freeman Lane of a driver huffing aerosol and smoking something out of a glass pipe. A woman was arrested on suspicion of possessing Tulune or Tuline and a uh, Controlled substance. 1.42 p.m., a woman from 100 block on Stewart Street reported an assault by a woman. She did not need medical attention. In 2.02 p.m., a report was taken from 100 block of Conaway Avenue of theft of items from a vehicle. In 2.26 p.m., a woman from 1400 block of Sedgworth Way reported a dog attacked her and her dog. It could not be located. 3.23 p.m., a report was taken from Rough and Ready Highway and Ridge Road of a man forcing a woman out of a vehicle. He could not be located. 3.35 p.m., a woman was cited on suspicion of shoplifting 100 block of West McKnight Way. And 4.53 p.m., a report was taken from 700 block of Freeman Lane of a vehicle hit a pedestrian. 6.40 p.m., a report was taken Plaza Drive of a driver smoking marijuana. And 7.55, a report was taken from Condon Park of an altercation. An 8.16 p.m. report was taken from East Main Street of physical fight involving three or four men. A man was arrested on suspicion of being drunk in public. A Nevada County Sheriff's Office on Sunday, 10.07 a.m., a report was taken from Rough and Ready Highway and Squirrel Creek Road of a man who, with no shirt throwing rocks at cars. At 11.11 a.m., a woman reported a man broke into her house and stole a phone to call 911. man was arrested on suspicion of being under the influence of a controlled substance.
In 10.56 a.m., a woman from 12,000 block of Banner Lava Cap Road reported theft of nearly one cord of wood. In 12.05 p.m., several golfers at Alta Sierra Drive and Kingsbury Greens Lane reported juveniles shooting BB guns at them. They were shooting in the area, not at golfers. In 12.32 p.m., a report was taken from American Hill Road and Constitution Court of juveniles playing paintball and refusing to leave. At 1.49 p.m., a report was taken from Anona Court of two juveniles with small rifles and face masks. At 7.39 p.m., a report was taken from Norlean and Alexandra Way of a man lying in the road who could not be located. At 8.36 p.m., a report was taken from 13,000 block of Highway 49 of a theft by a former employee. At 9.13 p.m., a report was taken from 15,000 block of Brooks Road of a possible attempted burglary. At 9.17 p.m., a report was taken from 17,000 block of Green Ravine Road of a theft. At 9.47 p.m., a report was taken from 10,000 block of Pleasant Valley Road of a transient camp in a camping in a tent who agreed to move on. Monday, 1.51 a.m., a woman was from the 11,000 block of Cedar Ridge Drive reported someone outside her window. Several raccoons were scared off. In 527 AM, a report was taken in 14,000 block of Auburn Road of a vehicle driving back and forth. A man was arrested on suspicion of being under the influence of a controlled substance. In 640 AM, a report was taken from 12,000 block of Pine Cone Circle of a man had been inside a truck and said he was looking for a different truck when he was confronted. Nevada City Police Department on Sunday 5.53 5.53 p.m., a report was taken from 700 block of Hoover Lane of juveniles shooting off fireworks. And on Monday, 12.08 a.m., a report was taken from Broad Street of a man passed out in a hallway. And that's it today for the blotter. Now another thanks to one of our underwriters who supports your only visual video news media in Nevada County. That's right, it's us, GV TV News. Christopher's Old World Deli and Catering Company has brought its delicious food and service downtown Grass Valley. Like desserts? They got them. You like international style lunches? They got them. Christopher's Deli and Catering for parties, get-togethers, weddings, or whatever. Open seven days a week. In today local in, in today's local news headline, Amanda Wilcox says why I am supporting Proposition 34. And fifth national prescription drug take back day results in another big haul for Grass Valley. I would like to read a story written by Amanda Wilcox and posted in newbinet.com. In January 2001, my only daughter, Laura, was murdered by a person with severe mental illness. Laura was shot four times at Point Blank Range at the Nevada County Behavioral Health Clinic. When the rampage of the clinic and a nearby restaurant ended, three people lay dead. Three were se- severely injured. A community was shaken and the world has diminished by the loss of an incredible young woman. Laura, bright and beautiful at age 19, was extraordinarily capable, kindness, and spirit. She was an outstanding student and leader. She wanted to make a positive difference in the world. Laura had unlimited possibilities and the brightest of prospects. My husband and I had always been opposed to the death penalty. Of course, our opposition had been purely theoretically, but we never thought we would personally be touched by violent crime. After Laura was killed, we leaned on our long-held beliefs and remained opposed to the death penalty. The issue had become very personal to us, and we learned more about the death penalty. Our opposition became deeper conviction. I have learned that the criminal justice system can make mistakes, and there will always be a risk of executing an innocent person. 141 innocent people have been wrongly sentenced to death in our country. Some have even been executed. Hundreds of innocent people have been convicted of serious crimes in California. Three were sentenced to death. I had a profound experience of meeting a man who had been wrongfully accused. He had done nothing wrong, but tragically, 25 years of his life was spent in prison. He eventually was released. An execution, of course, can never be reversed. I have learned that the death penalty is neither swift nor certain. Most inmates on death row die of old age. The lengthy process of trials, appeals, and anticipated execution keeps surviving family members in limbo. I know from experience that each court event is traumatic. I have 
learned that the death penalty costs far more than life without parole. I can think of many better uses of money, such as more funding for schools and victim services and violent prevention, including treatment for mental illness and more resources for law enforcement. As a mother of a murdered daughter, I considered myself tough on violent crime. I want criminals to be held accountable for their actions. I want dangerous murderers to be incarcerated and separated from society forever so that no longer can, they can do harm. Life in prison with absolutely no chance of parole accomplishes this. I know firsthand that the families of murdered victims want legal finality. The death penalty in California is a false promise that traps survivors into decades of legal proceedings and delays. Executions rarely happen. The survivors have no control over the process. The death penalty places attention on the murderer. I always wanted to focus on Laura. The man who killed Laura will be incarcerated for the rest of his life. I have finality. I can move on. Prop 34 places the death penalty with life in prison with absolutely no chance of parole. The official announces Prop 34 found that California would save $130 million each year. Prop 34 also directs $100 million of these savings of law enforcement for murder, solving more rapes and murders. A shocking 45% of murders and finding criminals before they can do more harm would truly protect us. Norm Stamper, a former Seattle police chief and 28-year veteran in the San Diego Police Department, said at best, he wrote, life in prison with no prayer of parole would be the toughest sentence on our books. It ensures that the guilty never get out, keeps us from ever executing an innocent person, and allows us to spend millions of dollars wasted each year on a death penalty on programs that will actually make it safer. By all accounts, death penalty system in California is broken. Join me in replacing it with justice that works for everyone. Please vote for Prop 34. Another uh, uh, notice from the Grass Valley Police. The fifth time in two years, Grass Valley residents emptied medicine cabinets, bedside tables, kitchen drawers, and unwanted, unused, and expired prescription drugs and took them to collection sites located throughout the city as part of the Drug Enforcement's DEA National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. On Saturday, September 29th, the Grass Valley Police Department co-hosted three separate collection sites along with the Coalition of Drug-Free Nevada County. The results of these efforts helped to dispose of unwanted and unused pharmaceuticals more safely and prevent their misuse or contamination of the environment. The Grass Valley event as one of the 107 state and local law enforcement partners worked at 156 locations, collected 23,329 pounds, more than 12 tons of prescription medication from members of the public. When added to the collections of Northern and Central California from the DEA's previous four take-back events, nearly 100,000 pounds of prescription medication have been removed from circulation. A total of 488,395 pounds, or 244 tons, was collected nationwide during the most recent event. According to the 2011 Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the NSDUH, more than 6 million Americans abuse prescription drugs. That same study revealed that more than 70% of people abusing prescription pain relievers got them through friends or relatives, a statistic that includes raiding the family medicine cabinet. A National Prescription take back, Drug Take-Back Day aims to provide a safe, convenient, and responsible means of disposal while also educating the general public about the potential for abuse of these medications. DEA's take-back event are a significant piece of the White House's prescription drug abuse prevention strategy released in 2011 by the Office of the National Drug Control Policy. Disposal of unwanted, unused, or expired drugs is one of the four strategics for reducing prescription drug abuse and diversion laid out by in epidemic responding to America's prescription drug abuse crisis. The other strategies include education of health care providers, patients, parents, and youth, enhancing and encouraging the establishment of prescription drug monitoring programs in all of the states, and increased enforcement to address doctor shopping and pill mills. Shortly after DEA's first Take Back Day event two years ago, Congress passed and President Obama signed the Secure and Responsible Drug Disposal Act of 2010, which amended the Controlled Substance Act, CSA, allowed DEA to develop permanent, ongoing, and responsible methods of disposal. Prior to the passage of the Disposal Act, the CSA provided no legal means for transferring possession of controlled substance medications from users to other individuals for disposal. DEA is currently in the process of drafting regulations, but until the creation of permanent regulations, DEA will continue to hold take-back days. Well, during this weekend, there is an NCTV telethon to raise funds to help finish the studio. TV, TV News feels we should at least mention this as we are one of the main ingredients to the daily programming there. 
Many other producers are helping in this event, and it's a 1 to 5 on Saturday, a live show with music and some producers hosting. We wish them well and hope that the community helps them succeed. As the former special events coordinator, I really enjoyed my time working at the station with Paul Manicucci, the best executive director that was the big influence on the future of this station. At this time, I would also like to thank all the people that helped make the original Thursday Night Market Live a success, and also all the supervisors, mayors, and city officials and businesses that were involved in our production the first year. Grass Valley Television will continue to bring you local events with our productions, and some of them are aired on NCTV, but also you can watch us on grassvalleytelevision.com. Our news direct, just go to www.gvtv.org. You can get it streamed on nevadacountytv.org or Comcast Channel 11 in Nevada County and Suddenly 16 in Truckee and Alta Sierra. Support NCTV to keep us on Comcast. That's it for local news today. We would like to thank Amy Goodman, Reuters, Associated Press, UBINET, Sierra Foothills Report, the Union, local law enforcement, and others for the sourcing of our news and you for watching. Remember, we are the only visual video news media in Nevada County, and we are free for you to watch seven days a week. If you have local stories and would like to have them aired on our news, please email us with a limit the story to 750 words and if you have pictures please include them in the email to grassvalleytelevision at gmail.com. Please include some type of contact information for verification of facts. You can watch this broadcast on Comcast Cable, NCTV, Channel 11 in Nevada County, 8 a.m., 3 p.m., 7.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, 10.30 a.m., Saturday, and 8 p.m., Sunday, and Suddenlink Channel 16 in Truckee and Alta Sierra, same times. We also are streamed on the Internet, NCTV's Digital Media Center website at nevadacountytv.org and our website, gvtv.org. And don't forget, Grass Valley Television, a place 24-7 on the net, grassvalleytelevision.com. We post to Facebook, YouTube, blip.tv, and many other sites and have RSS feed and video podcasts on iTunes. Just search under video podcast for GVTV News. Grass Valley Television.